coach that. Ellie is, as it says, a book coach and author. She is. Sorry, the lights are a bit bright, but yeah, I'm Jonathan. see that, but that's a family tree of the Gilchrist family, who are the family that are in the book. So basically you have two men, um, Frederick and Jacob, who are brothers, um, and they um, both want to inherit this house called Issington Drive, which is based on a real house in Stratford, which I'll be telling you about in a minute. Um, and it, technically, Jacob should inherit, because he's the eldest, but in fact he's not behaved very well, so the parents give it to Frederick. And then what that means is it comes down to the girls, Clara, who's Frederick's daughter, and Stephanie, who's Jacob's daughter. So both of these young women are fighting for the manor. So when um, the will comes out, it's revealed that actually the one who marries first gets the house. So then along comes a man, as happens. So they both want the house, and they both want the same man, but the story isn't about the man, it's really about the manor and how they can get it, and who's going to get it, and more importantly, whether the manor can be saved, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a moment. And then we have a young woman called Phoebe, and Phoebe is from a poor background, unlike Clara and Stephanie, and she also wants the manor, because she wants to be wealthy and have an easy life, compared with the very poor life that she has now. So that is a summary of the plot, but the story all centres around a house called Islington Manor, which was based on a house called Avonbank. So I'm sure some of you have already heard about various incarnations of Avonbank. So, there were three houses that were close to the river, and the first one wasn't called Avonbank, it was called St Mary's. And it was the one that was probably nearest to the church, and some people say that it was near to the charnel house, where the charnel house used to be. Um, and there's a lovely story about um, St Mary's, which you can believe or not believe. Um, according to a document from um, 1699, the house actually belonged to uh, a man who was living, Thomas Green, who was living in New Place. And the story goes that Shakespeare stayed there for a while, and that's where he wrote the ghost part of Hamlet. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but it's a lovely story. And the idea is that St Mary's was actually built on um, some kind of old building 
um, possibly an old college or medieval building, and that some of those materials remained and passed on to the next house. So the next house was, was called Avonbank, and it was also next to the church. And this is a picture of the first Avonbank. Now, some of the other pictures of Avonbank actually show it with a tunnel that um, the children who used to um, go there, live there, used to call the elephant's trunk. And the first Avon Bank had a history of being a school. In fact, it was a school three times. And the best known school that it was a school for was um, the Mrs. Byerleys. And they had a, a pupil who ended up becoming um, a lady called Is Elizabeth Gaskell. She started off as Elizabeth Stevenson, no relation to me. Um, and then she married Mrs. Uh, Mr. Gaskell. And we probably all know her as the author of North and South Cranford and also Charlotte Bronte's biographer. So, the, the Byerleys lived, well, they had their school in another part of the area, in Barford, and then they moved to Stratford, and they took Elizabeth and other pupils with them. And she stayed there about three years, um, and then she left. But she stayed in touch with them for about 20 years afterwards, and the school carried on. But at some point, the school was taken over by another group of young women called the Ainsworths, and they also ran a school. And in fact, some of those um, Ainsworths had been governesses at the school when the Byerleys were in charge. But they took over from the Byerleys, and it was still a school, and it was still the first Avon Bank. And you, I'm sure you can see from this that it was a, a lovely property. And that was, again, quite close to the churchyard. But sadly, things don't last forever. But before we go on to the next stage in the story, you can see this lovely map. Um, and I should say that all the images, except if, with a few exceptions, are courtesy of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust. So thanks to them for letting me use these images. And if you look at the red part or the pink part of the map, you can see, I think, the elephant's trunk, which is the little bit that sticks out towards where the road is. And you can see how it's, it's very close to, um, well, to the church and all the area around there. So this is a picture of the same house, but it's in 1866. So what happened was that things changed. So it got to be 1860, and um, the person who owned the house, a Mr. Battersby, decided to sell it to Charles Flower, Flower of the Brewing family. And what they did was they rented the house out. They didn't live in it. They rented it out to yet more school teachers. And this is a lady you can see her in the front of the photograph called um, Smith. Um, Martha Smith and that those were her pupils and uh, it is or it was a really lovely house but the reason that I use the house not this one but the second one I'm going to explain to you in a moment so when Charles and Sarah Flower bought the house they didn't live in it so this postcard which I think is lovely is actually um, inaccurate because it says that it's the home of Charles and Sarah Flower it was their house he owned it, but they didn't live in it. I think um, Charles had a survey done when he bought the house in 1860, and he discovered, he was really disappointed to find that it was actually in a bad state of rep repair. And so what they did, um, very sadly, is they had the house demolished, um, which was sad, and then they built a replacement. But before I show you the replacement, I just want to point out about the boating tunnels. You can see the tunnels there on the river. Um, and in fact, there's still evidence of those today. If you go up to the road on Waterside and you look, well, actually, I think Southern Lane, and you look, there's steps down to what used to be the tunnels where people would go to get out onto the river. And um, you, it's quite hard to, but some, if you look across from the river, you can see a little bit of where the boating tunnels were. Um, and that is also evident in the second Avon Bank. So Charles and Sarah were keen to have a new house that was theirs. So in 1867, in 1866, this house, very sadly, was demolished and they replaced it with a new one. And that's the new one. And I think you'll agree that it's quite um, stark and bleak, though this isn't a great picture. And it was designed in the Italian style, um, which was thought to be quite grand at the time and it got a good review in the Herald. And actually, when you see pictures of it later on, you'll realise that actually it was really beautiful. And this is the house that inspired my novel. And when I wrote the novel, I got the plans of the house and I had the characters walking through the house and, and living as it actually was at that time. 
And so this house is interesting to me for one particular reason, which was the, a main reason which I put into the book, which is that the flowers, want, they, they talked about having a library for the town, a public library or some kind of um, resource for people in Stratford. And the idea was that when they died, that they would pass this house on to the town as well as the grounds, and that it would become a library for the future. Well, that didn't happen. The house was demolished. And I thought, first of all, I thought that's really sad because I'm an ex-librarian and I love libraries and I thought we really ought to have a magnificent house like this as a library, but obviously we don't. Um, and I thought it'd be really nice to create a novel where maybe you could start again and you had a house and the question is, would the house survive? And obviously I'm not going to answer that question. You'd have to. <laughs> um, so that is the real life story of Charles and Sarah Flowers and why their idea, their dream, which sadly didn't happen, helped inspire the novel. And that's why everything is centred around this house, which I call Islington Manor. So uh, I'm sure we all know about the flowers. Um, they, you know, Charles was involved with the brewery and they, the brewery was doing really well, so that was great. Um, and Sarah was very supportive. They were also really keen on the theatre. Um, so they used to have play readings in the Palm House, which is the conservatory that you can see at the end. And Charles used to write his own plays, so um, they used to do the readings there as well. And they had quite a lot of local connections, so it was obviously quite a um, convivial time. And they used to open the, the grounds and have people in and events. And Sarah planted a lot of trees, and probably a lot of the trees that we see now when we walk around the, the gardens were planted um, because of Sarah and her wish to make it as beautiful as possible. back a bit there and I'm going to tell you that's the next stage in the story but I'm also going to tell you something else so when I wrote the book I, I wanted to not have it just about people who were wealthy and privileged but also about people who worked in the town which is why Phoebe was very important but there is a character in the in the story called Stella and she comes to Stratford and she's from a country background so she's not very versed in the ways of towns and she wanted a job and at that time, it was really difficult for young women to get a decent job. And if you were successful, if you were doing well, you got a job, like Phoebe did, in a draper's, like the one that used to be on Wood Street, I believe where Nationwide is now. So Phoebe did well to get a job in a draper's, but Stella had a much more difficult job. So if you couldn't get a job in a draper's, you'd try for another sort of shop. And if you couldn't get a job in a shop, you might try for a job at the brewery. And if you didn't succeed in the brewery, then you could try the aluminium factory, which eventually became a munitions factory. So Stella got a job in the brewery, but it was really hard work. They used to, usually the young women were put in the bottling section, which was right down below, and they would spend all day with their ankles in water. So it was really tough work, and it was noisy and hard work and, you know, difficult, but they stuck it out. And Stella, as I say, is quite a naive young girl. So, you know, she sees at the end of her first week, she sees all these men getting their pay packet and all these women outside queuing up. And she says, oh, isn't that lovely? All these wives have come to see their husbands. And her friend laughs and says, no, they've actually just come to get their pay packets so that they don't drink it all at the pub every <laughs> night. So I thought at this point, I'd just read you a few um, bits of information about brewing. So Shipston, just down the road, at one point had 14 pubs for 1,400 people. And it, yeah, that's quite, that's quite a lot, isn't it? And it was described as a, a poor sort of place. And then um, on Saturday nights, people came all the way from Birmingham to drink Flowers Bitter, which was obviously very popular. And the Flowers did really well with their brewery, and they actually started off with... Um, a premises between Clopton Road and Birmingham Road and then later on they moved and got a new premises up on the Birmingham Road. Um, for working people the mop was like their one day out and on mop day the pubs used to open at 6am in the morning. Pity it doesn't happen like that now. <laughs> um, and once apparently somebody actually drowned in one of the vats and I know that sounds horrendous but it probably happens more often than we think. Um, and then, sorry, I'm just having difficulty reading here with the light. Um, apparently in 1948, there was probably post-war, there was a shortage of glasses. 
Um, so people were drinking out of jam jars. They were that keen to have a drink. So that's brewing in Stratford. Um, so obviously Charles was really important as well because he helped um, establish the Memorial Theatre. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that afterwards. But basically to sum up this, the Charles and Sarah part of the story, who were a great inspiration for me, um, Sarah lived till, she, till 1908. Charles died a bit earlier in 1892. And they did hand the house and the grounds and a lot of properties on Southern Lane and Waterside over to the Memorial Theatre as it was then, because it had been built by then. Um, and the idea was that all these properties would provide rents which would enable their dream of the library and also the idea that there would be a walkthrough for the public from down where the theatre was up to the churchyard without you having to go onto the road. And that actually is possible, providing the gates in the, in the wall of the church are open. Um, but obviously the, the library and the house thing didn't happen. So that is the legacy that they left us. But in the meantime, the house needed to be rented out. So it was rented out to a family called the Melvilles. And this is the Melvilles. So this is before they came to Avonbank. And as you can see from the photo, William Melvin was a vicar. And he followed another vicar called Arbuthnot. Um, and the, the Melville family were at Avonbank and in Stratford for a long time. So the couple had two daughters, Margaret, or Meg as she was called, and Eleanor, who was the same as her mum's name, but people called her Budge. So I'll call her Budge so we don't get confused. And then the boy, David. So they had a very sort of lively life in Stratford. They also got involved with the theatre. Eleanor, the mum, she became a theatre governor in due course. Um, obviously, Will, uh, William was busy with his parishioners' duties, um, but the girls also got involved in the town. And when the war happened, um, Eleanor, the mum, was involved with the Clopton House Hospital, but the girls also did recitals and singing, so they got involved in raising money for charity. So it was very much a family thing. Um, and I will show you another picture. So this is after they moved to um, Avonbank. And you can see that there's another lady in the picture as well. And you can see also that the girls are a bit older. And the other lady's Marion Terry. So the Melvilles were very friendly with a lot of people locally, including um, Ellen Terry's family, Marion, and also um, Frank Benson's um, theatre company, because they were very much involved in theatricals. And again, they used the Palm House for all those sorts of activities as well. So um, just as an aside, the Terrys apparently had 11 children, of which Ellen is the one that everybody knows. But there were actually five um, Terrys that went into acting, um, one young man and four girls. And Marion was an actor as well as Ellen, and there was another actor, Kate, who I believe is the grandmother of John Gielgud. And just, I wanted to show you this because I wanted you to see how Avonbank was really beautiful because that first photograph doesn't do it justice. And if you look at it here, you can see, even though it's black and white, how lovely it was with all the greenery and the, the, um, just the sort of terrace and everything in the Palm House. And again, we've got Mary and Terry with Mrs. Melville. Um, I'll just briefly say a little bit about Mrs. Melville because um, part of her inspired my book as well because um, she was, I mean, you can see that she's very smart. She always wore a suit, but not, people often said she looked a bit mannish, but she didn't, she never wore trousers. She always wore a suit with a skirt. Um, and she was very popular, um, but she also liked to attend church. And there's a lovely story about how once she was in church and a bishop came along and he said, um, sir, would you mind taking your hat off? And of course, <laughs> of course it was Mrs. Melville. Um, and the other lovely story about the church was that um, Arbuthnot, who was a very popular vicar, he was, he was really well liked, he wanted all the pews to be free for the parishioners, because sometimes people had family pews and they'd pay for that, and so they could go to their pew, and he didn't agree with that. So he had a lot of resistance, but eventually over a period of time he got so that the pews were um, for everybody. But of course, um, William Melville wasn't really happy with that. But I took those stories and I sort of 
wove them into my novels. So we've got one character, Sadie, who's Phoebe's mother, and she knows her place, so she sits at the back of the church, whereas there's another character who thinks, you know, blow that, I'm going to sit where I like. So she goes and sits right at the front. And in fact, one of the traditions was that people who needed food would sit at the front and they would get bread. So it was a way to get some extra support. And I'll talk a little later about um, how difficult it was if you were poor and you didn't have a lot of resources. Um, so this is um, William Melville on his bike. And he was, as I say, he wasn't as popular as Arbuthnot. And in fact, um, sometimes people thought he was a bit authoritarian and he liked his own way. And apparently he did once go down to the post office and he was asked to fill in a form. And he said to the postmaster, can you do it for me? And the postmaster said, no, you've got to do it yourself. Um, and he never spoke to the man again. <laughs> so he was, a, he was a man of you know clear intents and decisions and so on. But on the other hand, um, apparently he, they did invite children from the girls' industrial home on College Street round to the house. And he was very kind to them. And if they were tired and fell asleep, he didn't bother waking them up. He just let them sleep on. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the, the firs. Now, the firs used to be a vicarage. Um, and Arbuthnot, the vicar before Melville, he did live at the firs for a while. And I think, I've, I just got this thing about houses. I love old houses. And I just think it's such a shame when they're, they're demolished. And sadly, the firs is no longer with us. And, if you go past the police station, that's where the firs used to be. Um, but the firs gardens, or the grounds, have been saved because Mary Corelli, who I'm sure some of you have heard of, bought a piece of land in 1909 and it ended up being the firs gardens or the park that we all know around Evesham Place. So although we lost the house, we do still have the grounds and we have to think, thank Mary Corelli for that. So what I think is that apart from Shakespeare, who's obviously um, very well known in Stratford, there are lots of other literary connections as well. So we have Elizabeth Gaskell and we have Mary Corelli, and I'm going to talk briefly about her in a minute because she had a walk-on part in my book. Um, and there were also a lady that probably is not so well known called um, Bertha de Corsi Laffin. And she was the wife of the headmaster, um, De Laffin. And his actually he he actually was his real name was was just Mr. Laffin, but he added the de Corsi, which was his middle name, and put it onto the end to make him sound more grand. Anyway, he was he was um, head of the school Hayes for ten years, and his wife obviously supported him. But she was a novelist in her own right, and she wrote nineteen books. And whereas people like Mary Corelli are becoming more well known, and everyone's probably heard of Elizabeth Gaskell, or may have heard of her. Um, Bertha is, is a lot less known. So, to go back to Mary Corelli, what I wanted to do with the book is I wanted, because Clara wants to save the house, and I wanted her to raise money, and to raise money, she's got to get a celebrity. So I decided the perfect celebrity for her to have would be Mary Corelli. So I got um, Clara to have an event, which was something that the Flowers did and also something that the Melvilles did. They had garden parties. It was very popular there, sometimes to raise funds and just sometimes for the workers. Um, and so I got Clara to do that and Marie Corelli came along and obviously that boosted the numbers. And we have here a lovely picture of, of Marie in her conservatory, um, which is really nice. And just so you can see it, because I think it's, she's got a lovely signature. Um, and as we know, she was very prolific and also very important to Stratford in terms of saving the town's buildings. But I just, I suppose a bit like Hitchcock does with his films, I just wanted to have her there as a walk-on part in the book. is a joy when it works, isn't it? Right, okay. So, um, this lovely photograph, I'm not sure what it is exactly. It could be one of these workers' parties that did happen. If you look at the, the gathering of men in the left-hand side, they're very smart, but they look a bit uncertain, as if they're not sure they should be there. <laughs> or it could be somebody's special event or a, a party or so on. And you can see, as well as the church, obviously, you can see the veranda of the second Aiden Bank on 
the right hand side. So I think this was probably in the flowers time, probably before the Melvilles moved in in 1908, but I don't know that. I, but I just think it's, it's very evocative and also it was partly how I envisaged um, when Clara had her parties to raise money for the house. Okay, so um, obviously this is a Shakespeare Memorial Theatre and as I'm sure you all know it burnt down in 1926, um, which was a great tragedy. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm showing you this is because the, um, there was a lady who worked there called Alice Rainbow and she eventually, she worked in the new theatre as well and she became a governor of the theatre. And also, if you remember, Eleanor Melville was also a theatre governor. Um, so they had that in common, but probably not a lot else. But there is a story that Alice, who used to work in the theatre, this one here, um, was in the theatre the day of the fire, and she heard, well, she realised there was a fire behind the curtain, behind the stage. So she rushes behind, and then, because there's lots of smoke, she opens a few windows and doors mm -hmm. to let the smoke out. And it was a very windy day, the day the fire burnt down. So, of course, that's not going to help, is it? And I thought that was a, well, it's a horrific story, actually, but it was also a really interesting one. So there is a little fire in the book. I'm not going to say where. And um, I put that story into the novel, but obviously with a fictional character who's nothing to do with this lady, Alice Rainbow. And as I say, she did go on to work in the new theatre, and she worked there for many years and became a governor. So she was obviously... And I believe her father had worked there as well, so she was a well-established part of the community. And it, just to add on what you may know anyway, that it was thanks to Archie Flower that a lot of the development of the new theatre happened. That was Charles' nephew. And so the story goes that he and one of his colleagues were writing in the ashes, more or less trying to work out where to put the new theatre that opened in 1932. So they were determined that even though this, oh, a large part of this lovely building had burned down, that there would be a new theatre, that Stratford would not be without its theatre. So the last part of the puzzle that I want to tell you about is a man called William Quatremain. He's an artist, <coughs> as I'm sure you know. And part of the novel is also about... Um, artists and art. So Clara is a landscape painter like um, Quatremain was and Gwilym, the man that she wants to marry, is a portrait painter and at that time portrait painting was a really good occupation for men because you could travel around the big houses, you could make a lot of money and you could establish, establish your reputation and Gwilym looks down on Clara's paintings because he says oh it's only landscapes, you know it's not very special but actually she was a very good painter and I think that Quatremain was also a very good painter and has been not recognised as much as he should. But this picture is particularly important in the novel because this is where, when he and his mum, after his dad died, when his mum moved to Stratford, William Wells Quatremain, they moved into this house, which is number 45 Waterside, and obviously doesn't exist anymore. So I took the house, which I thought was very cute, and I put it in the book and gave it to... Um, a lady called Lucienne, who is a poet, and she is the person who starts the whole story off because it's because of her that Issington Manor gets built in the first place. Um, and in, in real life, um, a child throws a ball through the window and breaks the glass of Quatremain's house when he's living there as a boy with his mum. And I use that story to give Lucienne a reason to move. She didn't want to live in the house then. She decided she was going to build her own magnificent manor that she could live in um, with her man, or so she thought. So this next picture is how I like to think of the second Avon Bank. And we don't know, I've, I've asked, I've talked to people at the birthplace, and we don't know for sure if that is a Quatremain painting. I like to think it is because I think it looks in his style and it's certainly lovely. And we do know that Eleanor Melville commissioned a picture of Avon Bank when they moved in. So it could be. Um, but anyway, I think it's quite lovely and it shows the second house with the veranda really well and it shows the boating tunnels. Um, and I think I should have said earlier as well that the second Avon Bank is slightly 
further away from the church than the first Avon Bank. Um, it's not quite in the same place that the first Avon Bank was. So, when you're a writer of fiction, I mean, I'm really, um, I'm really, I, I really care about research, and I think it's really important to get your facts right, and I do a lot of research. But one of the beauties of being a novelist, rather than someone who's doing non-fiction, is that you can make things up. So my rule of thumb is stick to the facts, but if you need to change something, that's fine, so long as you tell the reader that you're doing that, so they know where they are. So this is the flood of 1901. It's in my book, but it, in my book it's not in 1901, it's in around 1910, because the novel's set between 1908 and 1912, and I really wanted to include the flood because it fits with the story. And I do tell people who read the book that that's actually what's happened, so they know that I've fictionalised history and changed it slightly. Um, but it was, as you can see, it was a devastating flood, and for people that lived in the cottages, that area then, around Waterside and Southern Lane, was not like it is now. It was full of warehouses, it was full of um, industrial warehouses and storage areas for all the trade that was going up and down the canal and the river. So it wasn't, although it probably was quite pretty in a way, it wasn't as pretty as it is now. And when the flood happened, people obviously, sometimes it might be as high as six foot, so they'd have to carry all their furniture upstairs. And apparently you could claim afterwards for loss and the implication from what I've read is that some people would take all the furniture upstairs and then claim that they'd lost it and they'd make a bit of money. But obviously I can't verify that. Um, and the other story that I heard about that area is that when the Bancroft Basin was filled in, um, because of the, it was smelly and the council weren't very happy, um, so that they thought it was a health hazard, so they filled it in. But the wealthy people weren't happy because they used to use it as a skating rink in the winter, and the poorer people weren't happy because they used to dump all their rubbish in it, which, <laughs> which might be why it smells. So you can never, I suppose the message of that is you can never please everybody, can you? So I, I changed the flood, and also um, when Lucienne, the poet, comes to um, Stratford, when I was going to have her come by train, but the date that she arrives, there aren't any trains. So I had to have her come by coach, and she arrives at the Red Horse Inn, which is now where Marks and Spencer's is. So, um, there are a couple of things that just to finish off. These are all the sorts of material that I used in my research, um, with, the la with the exception of the last one, Expert Opinion. I didn't need to consult anybody, but with the book I wrote before, which was about the retail industry, I did consult someone who was an expert in shopping in Victorian England, and I learned a lot from her. Um, but I've used a lot of sources and it's fascinating and the danger, as some of you know, is that if you spend so much time researching you never get round to the actual writing. Um, and I'd like to end with two things. First of all, um, a quote from, um, if I can find it, excuse me, from Ursula Bloom, who also a novelist. And this, she wrote this to Eleanor Melville, the younger Eleanor, sorry, not Eleanor, Meg Melville. She wrote this in the 1950s and she said, Stratford has changed, alas, too much. I always stay at Shipston. Obviously it's improved since the time of the beer. Um, I don't think I could bear the old place now, not with all those crowds. <laughs> so I think, well, what would she think now? And my last thing was, when you're doing research, you never know what you'll find. And what I found when I was doing my research was this. In 2018, we had a really hot summer, and this happened in other places in the country, not just in Stratford, but what happened was that old foundations became visible. So I think you can see that that is the outline of the, of the old house mm -hmm. in Bank 2, mm -hmm. and I thought that was really magical. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'd be very happy to take them. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's fascinating because we live in the present Avon Bank 
yeah. the apartments that are built on the site, again, slightly further back, and the tunnel is still there. We have access from our side. Yes, so uh, yes, that was something I didn't say, actually, that the boating tunnels, obviously, they go into the river, but you, there are also, there were, well, they still are, tunnels that can take you across the road to the other side. Underneath some Yes, yes. That was the kitchen garden of the house. Where Aiden Bank paddocks are now was the garden, the kitchen garden for Aiden Bank. So that's why there's the tunnel. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Apparently, but why didn't they um, just walk across the road? They didn't want their servants being seen. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> Apparently, Eleanor Melville used to go across there uh, under the tunnels and she used to feed her cats. So there were loads of cats lived in those tunnels, fed by Eleanor Melville. That's a, I think that's a young Eleanor, wasn't it? Budge. Is that Budge? No, I thought, I thought it was Eleanor. Yeah? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Ellie, I've got an observation. I might not be right, but I think I am. No, that's fine. Photograph 15, which is the gathering. Yes. I believe that is down to Mary Corelli, because when Mary Corelli first came to Stratford in 1899, she was at um, Horse Crop for six months. Yeah. As a Renter. And before, in fact, she took over in Church Street, she actually moved into the Danner House, which is on the corner of Southern Lane and Old Town. Yeah. And she held, it's well recorded in Herald as well, she held a number of big literary parties. Winston Churchill came to one um, in the gardens, which is where the Avon Bank has been built now, the Avon Bank Flats. Mm. But the Danner House gardens used to go all that way back. And I think that gathering is one of her literary parties with the London elite that she invited up oh, in really? their house. I may be proven wrong, but I think that's... And if you look at the Holy Trinity Church view, yeah. it's exactly in the line. If you're standing, if you like, in that area, looking towards Holy Trinity. So the geography would, would say to me that's what it is. I think about 1901, 1901. Oh, well, that's, that's really interesting, yeah. Well, it's just as well I put her in my book then, really, isn't it? She obviously was such a, a key holder of garden parties, yes. Could you tell me when Avon Bank was demolished? 1867, the second one, 1866. Well, actually, no, it was demolished in 1866 and the flowers moved in in 1867. <laughs> so when, did we, when was the, the last Avon oh. Bank demolished? Oh, I've got an answer Oh, that. that's a yeah. good question. Um, in the 50s, I'm not, I exact, I'm not exactly sure of the year, but interesting if you talk about Cap, Cap, um, Canon Melville, when it, the Elmhurst, which was the home of the Fielding family, about 50 or 60 years, and when the last Fielding died in 1930-31, basically Canon Melville, and there's the correspondence, it's in the Birthplace Trust, of all his letters, and they're quite, he's quite sharp, trying to get money from the diocese to actually buy, or let's say to improve, um, Elmhurst, which is the opposite side of the road where the Methodist Church is now, and he was trying to improve it, and he came up with architect's plans for about £850, and the diocese turned him down. Because apparently in his letters, and they're in the Birthplace Trust Library, you'll find that he doesn't like the house he's living in, which is Avon Bank, mm. and he wants something better. <laughs> and that's, but he wanted it to his, he didn't get his way, and apparently I think um, a new vicarage was built just before the war at, in the corner of Old Town um, on College Street. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing, that Avon Bank was actually pulled down sometime in the late 1930s. If that is a guess again. Mm. I, I thought it was a bit later than that, but I'm not going to. Yeah, I'm later. Yeah. I thought it was in the 50s. Yeah. yeah. But um, one of the things that you know I've been thinking about is why did they pull it down? And I think because, from what I've heard, because Eleanor Melville lived there for so long, and obviously she was a tenant, and it's a big house, it probably wasn't maintained. So in the end, it was easier for them to demolish it rather than restore it, which is a shame, but happens all the time with really yeah. lovely old buildings. And it's yeah, and I think also after the war, building materials were very short after the war, yeah. so I suspect that contributed <coughs> to it as well. Could you, anyone, the other one was, where was that court remains house? That rather what, the number f the 45, number 45? The, the one that you showed, the painting. Where, the painting. Yeah, 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 that was... Yeah, it looks as if it was <coughs> around where the duck is or something. Yes, it was, it was no, just down the road. Near where, 
where the hotel is, the Arden Hotel. Yeah. It was oh, near wow. there. Yeah. And actually, that was something I didn't mention, but it was really interesting because Marie Corelli had a secretary called Annie Davis, mm. and she moved on to Waterside, and um, Meg Melville moved on to Waterside eventually. Um, and then, of course, we had Quatremain, first comes to Stratford, lives on Waterside, and then Annie Justins actually had a house built on Waterside, not far away, which is now still part of the um, Arden Hotel. So it was a very popular residential area. There's actually a plaque on the wall along Waterside where that stood because it's got a, an older history. Is that the one connected with Shakespeare's yeah. father? Yeah. 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 It is an extraordinary looking house with those sort of, mm. rena sort of 17th point. century feels. And then that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I walked up and down that road looking at the street lamps and trying to figure out exactly where it was. But it's it's quite, the wall is still there, I think, but it's quite hard because there's such a lot of changes. Yeah. And the railings, of course, are gone. But it is a lovely painting, but I, I really like Quatremain's work. I think it's quite um, evocative. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. Uh, just for a bit, the theatre still owns the freehold of Avon Bank Paddocks. Yeah because when we bought our apartment, it's signed by Gregory Doro, the oh, lease. Oh, but oh, the whole thing was delayed by a month because it's on his desk waiting for his signature and he went on holiday having forgotten to sign it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh sounds much like life really, doesn't it? <laughs> Things get forgotten. <laughs> yeah. Obviously you have read it, but one of my favorite sources for this period is Sarah Flower's diary. Yeah, it's <coughs> amazing. I mean, I didn't even mention all the stuff that goes on in there, like the yeah. travels that they did together. Charles and Sarah were great travellers, and they did a lot of travelling before she got ill, and then obviously he had his other commitments with the brewery and the theatre. But yeah, um, what what frustrates me about Sarah Flower's life is not is the stuff we don't know. You know, why they didn't have a family, what her illness was. Um, but even after her husband died, she still did a lot of, she gave a lot of money and she was still involved with the community. So, you know, she outlived him for quite a long, would it be 16 years, I think? So quite a long time. So, but that's history, isn't it? Sometimes you know it's the bits you don't know that drive you mad. Yeah. George Burton Shaw didn't share your view of the original <laughs> theatre <laughs> because you sent a telegram to Charles Flower congratulating him on the fire. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a shame. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm quite a fan of Vic obviously because I write Victorian history, Edwardian stuff. I love Victor, like um, the bank um, mm. on HSBC. Oh, that's the yeah. one. Yeah, I know it's. I know it's kind of. Well, it's it's very much of its time, and obviously the theatre, the first Memorial Theatre, was of its time. But um, that's you know that's the trouble with buildings, isn't it? We all have our own viewpoint on. Um, and the, the current theatre is also quite interesting in its way. I think it's more interesting now than it was when it was built. I think it's got more character, but that happens with buildings in general. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.